Before the U.S. sent Ukraine the first pallet of what would become about $8 billion in weapons and military equipment, officials had high-level discussions about whether these arms could fall into the wrong hands. Three government sources familiar with the transfers now tell Newsy that although they support Ukraine's defense, that fear remains. One source said U.S. officials calculated that Ukraine needs the weapons so urgently it reduces the risk of stockpiles being misused. But analyst Elias Youssef says weapons tend to outlive wars, even long ones. The real concern may be when the conflict comes to an end, which eventually it will. And when the demand by the Ukrainians diminishes, it may increase the incentive to find alternative markets for these systems. Analysts worry that bad actors like terrorists could acquire anything from portable anti-aircraft stinger missiles to small arms which are harder to track. Just last month, a Homeland Security bulletin warned that a pro-Al-Qaeda magazine was encouraging followers to travel to Ukraine for training and weapons to use in attacks against the West. Ukraine's defense minister, Alexei Reznikov, says that some weapons have GPS trackers, which a source in the intelligence community confirmed. He also said that the country is using a NATO logistics system to monitor weapons. This process was already underway, but we are happy to expand and increase its tempo to ensure the comfort comfort of our partners. Ukraine has erected a temporary special commission to keep track of weapons and equipment. But Jonah Leff, who traces the movements of illicit arms, says that's not enough. Ukraine's special commission to monitor these weapons is supposed to last for about a year. Is that enough time? A year is a, it's quite a short time for any monitoring of, of weapons, uh, that especially that are such, so valued. The, the proliferation or diversion of weapons can take place any time after a conflict ends. So it's important that uh, any group that's assembled to ensure proper management of weapons uh, continues that work really indefinitely. President Zelensky last week began a campaign against treason and collaboration with Russia. Ian Overton says the risk of smuggled weapons would come from potentially corrupt Ukrainians and entrepreneurial Russians. He's the executive director of Action on Armed Violence, an organization that investigates its causes. And he spoke about what he saw happen to Russian weapons in the port city of Odessa a year after Russia first invaded Ukraine in 2014. There I began to investigate uh, a, a port called Oktobirsk, uh, which was um, run at the time by a former Soviet uh, naval commander, um, had links to cronies associated with President Putin, and it seemed that weaponry systems, even in the height of this proxy war with Russia, were still... Um, coming through Ukraine uh, on trains, arriving off to Biersk, and then being pushed out from there in naval ships um, down to places like Syria um, and other uh, locations in Africa and South America. He says Russia has something to gain if Western weapons enter the black market and then surface in attacks outside of Ukraine. The Russian state itself, fighting a disinformation war, may seek to place uh, weapons seized from the Ukrainian forces, perhaps donated by NATO, and these may be sold on uh, in order to create a uh, 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 the propaganda of the deed, because if a NATO uh, donated weaponry system was found to have been used in, let's say, Nairobi by Salafist jihadists to take down an airline jet, then uh, that would be a, not only uh, an act of terrible terror, but it would be a pro profound propaganda coup for the Russian state who would point all fingers of culpability at Ukraine. The country before the Zelensky administration has already been a nexus of the illicit arms trade. Is there historical precedent here? I, I know we talked about that before. Ukraine kept 
uh, a large arsenal of Soviet era equipment up through the 1990s. And with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the economic crisis that followed, it gave the opportunity for criminal entrepreneurs to co opt that stockpile. And as much as 30 plus billion dollars worth of Soviet equipment was lost over many years in Ukraine. <laughs> The Russians are currently using American and European components on the battlefield in Ukraine. We were not expecting to see so many components uh, from all over the world in all of their weapon systems, including communication devices, other counter UAV equipment, uh, cruise missiles, uh, drones. So this was before the U.S. imposed sanctions for the war in Ukraine. This isn't, say, a get around to the production issues that manufacturers in Russia are having to try to keep up with the demand. Is that what you're saying? Some of these components were manufactured before and some after. Can you give me an example of a U.S. component? I'm not able to discuss company names at this point. Uh, I can say that we've seen several semiconductors, electronics, uh, guidance systems. Their use in weapons does constitute a violation of sanctions for some of these countries. And a Defense Department spokesperson tells me they won't approve transfers if they assess that a country can adequately secure weapons. The statement also reads, at the same time, it's important to recognize that there is a risk of weapons capture and diversion on the battlefield in any conflict. Now, the spokesperson also said that the best way to lower the risk is for Russia to just stop its war in Ukraine. Let's see if that happens. Sasha Ingber, thanks.